Welcome to Rethinking Trade with Lori Wallach, a podcast that unpacks international trade and how it affects you without putting you to sleep. Welcome, everybody. It's Rethinking Trade with Lori Wallach, and I'm Lori Wallach. Today, we are joined by Nathan Proctor. He's the Senior Director of the Campaign for Right to Repair at PERG, the Public Interest Research Group. It's an amazing national consumer group originally founded by Ralph Nader, and they have been leading this national fight to get right to repair policies and have succeeded in a couple of states of actually implementing them. So we got to celebrate Right to Repair Day on July 1st. And so it's very timely to have Nathan joining us. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful to be here. I think a lot of people will understand the concept of what right to repair means, but can you explain to us what that slogan means and how we got to this movement? I think people who grew up around electronics probably remembered a time when Basically, every piece of equipment that you bought, whether it was an appliance for your kitchen or some other piece of audio equipment, came with a full service manual. They were standardized parts. It was clearly designed so that you could open the device and switch out parts that broke. But over the years, we've kind of gotten away from building things to be fixable. And companies have also made the repair process highly proprietary so that they have exclusive access to what we need. And as a result, usually the only one who has all the materials necessary to complete the repair are the manufacturer or their authorized partners, or they can otherwise use their exclusive access to those repair parts to price gouge or otherwise harm the product owner. And they drive small repair businesses to close down those competitors. And Electronic waste is now the fastest growing part of the global waste stream. Consumers are replacing products way faster than they've ever done before. It's crazy, wasteful, expensive, and absurd. And so Right to Repair is a movement that says, hey, it's your stuff. You should be able to fix it. The manufacturer shouldn't tell you you have to go to their dealership or whatever. And they're not allowed to withhold the necessary materials, things like the software you need to reset the device after the repair and other critical aspects that are needed for modern repair. So that's what the laws require that we've passed. And overall, we also hope to create and foster a robust environment where people can fix things and they have multiple choices. We think that that creates a more resilient, consumer-friendly, sustainable kind of ecosystem for our electronic gadgets. And it's not just electronics, but also folks' cars. Someone backed into my headlight. I went to the dealer. It was a ridiculous charge. So then I went to my local repair shop and they said, well, we have to get the dealer part. I said, I will go find it at a junkyard. I did. I was feeling very happy. It was so much less money until I found out that the local car fixer guy had to pay $500 to have the Chevy guy come reprogram the junkyard headlight Or he could put it in and it wouldn't work. So this stuff impacts all of us. If you live in a rural area, it's farm machinery, it's everything. And it's become a huge money-sucking scam to say nothing, as Nathan did, about all the waste. So Nathan, great news. You guys have passed right to repair bills in some states. Tell us what they require and how you did it. Yeah, it's true. And I would say to your earlier point, when I say electronics... Electronics are now everything. I mean, there's microchips in just about every single product that they make. And so, yes, it does include farm equipment and cars. And in fact, the first right to repair victory was around automobiles by the coalition that came together for car repair, representing independent mechanics. And they passed a law in Massachusetts in 2012 actually went to the ballot and passed 86 to 14 uh, in front of voters in the state of Massachusetts, which standardized the OBD2 port, which is like the data port in the car, and required manufacturers to share more information about car repair. Obviously, there are still issues with car repair, firmware access, which is what you described with the headlight being one of them. So after the car victory... The folks that were working on repair of other kinds of equipment, namely this would be iFixit and Repair.org, which are the big original thought leaders on right to repair, 
they decided, hey, if it works for cars, it should work for every single other product with a microchip in it. And that was the start of our model legislation. We saw a path to do it in the States. You know, I got involved in like 2017. But our first real breakthrough is we passed a law in New York in 2022, which, although it was narrowed by the governor, was the first right to repair bill that we passed. And then we followed that up pretty quickly by passing laws in Colorado, which covered power wheelchairs and farm equipment. And then we passed a broad consumer right to repair that covered consumer and business electronics in Minnesota. And then another bill, even stronger bill in California. And then Oregon passed a a much stronger bill this spring. And then Colorado passed another bill. And again, all of these bills require manufacturers of covered products to give consumers or independent repair shops the same parts, tools, and information that they make available for their own repair offerings. With it, it is fundamentally an antitrust approach to the problem, saying we can enable competition in the repair market. That'll keep costs low and choice high. DIY repair also is a critical choice. I mean, some people will do repairs that are not kind of economically viable in the open market because it's their thing and they want to and it's interesting and repair is fun. So it creates a lot more opportunities for reuse and repair. And we're really excited that now New York, California, and Minnesota laws are in effect. We're seeing more repair materials come online, not as much as is required by the law. So we have more work to do, but we're, we're really excited about the progress we're making. And how does it look on the national scene? Well, the funny thing is, if you kind of look at the history, the legal tradition of repair as it relates to IP rights, intellectual property rights of manufacturers, copyrights, patents, and then you look at the rights of the owner of the product, the purchaser of the product, there's always been an understanding that the owner has the right to repair the product. That's baked into the 1975 Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. It's baked into the Sherman Act. This is a principle of American legal history. And so, to some degree, we are trying to reclaim that in the digital age because as everything is run on software now, that has kind of layered the protections we afford to copyright now covering the functioning of physical objects. This is not a particularly old problem, right? Because when your John Deere tractor broke down in 1955, the manufacturer's IP rights were just the patents on the equipment. Now, a patented physical machine, you can actually get the full exploded diagram of how that exactly works from the patent office public domain information. Those patent rights were to protect John Deere from somebody else making the exact same thing in the exact same way to protect their innovation. But the the owner's right to open it up, to change it, to tinker with it, to fix it, was protected as part of that process. Now that that mechanical piece is replaced by a computerized piece, you're not allowed to touch the software. They're allowed to lock the software. They're allowed to have exclusive software tools this is all protected by copyright. So really, I would say the history of right to repair is it's always been an American law. And the digitization of our products has created new opportunities for kind of hostile monopolization. Is it possible that we might have a national right to repair anytime soon? We are continuing to try to find ways to enforce the existing antitrust protections that are in favor of the consumer's right to repair. For example, the FTC just sent warning letters to eight companies for conditioning their warranties on exclusive use of the manufacturer's replacement parts or repair services. That is illegal under the 1975 Maddox Warranty Act in almost every case, and certainly in the cases that the FTC was warning about. But this is also very common. That is one thing that the federal government can do The Department of Justice has weighed in in the class action lawsuit against John Deere saying, no, their conduct is illegal. You can look at the federal anti-tying rules that protect competition in certain marketplaces. John Deere's in violation of those. So on some level, there's some existing enforcement work that can be done at the national level to protect right to repair. I would not expect that Congress will pass a robust right to repair law. But I do think that there are some more smaller things that Congress can and could do to improve repair. For example, there's an extremely popular 
bipartisan act called the Repair Act, which affects data, repair data for cars transmitted over the internet. That has like 50-something co-sponsors, completely even split of Democrats and Republicans. So that has a good chance of happening. And then we've also been working to present copyright changes that clarify that it's not a violation of copyright to fix something that you own, which if that sounds like a crazy thing to have to specify in the law, it is totally crazy, but is necessary given the way that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act it was kind of overbroad in certain aspects. So this is all really important information and we all need to have our stuff fixed, but you're probably wondering, why are we hearing about this on a program about rethinking trade? And this gets into how trade agreements are constantly being rigged by corporate interests to impose policies that have nothing to do with trade. And this is a classic example. So we've we've been talking about so-called digital trade rules that the big tech companies have been trying to push into trade agreements. They have nothing to do with trade, but they are trying to limit what kind of policies governments can set that affect technology. And one of those rules, which was called source code, that basically make it an obligation of governments not to require access to certain kinds of information as somehow a trade guarantee. The Biden administration said, not so fast. It was a rule that forbid governments from access to or requiring anyone have access to source code and algorithms. And they defined algorithms in a really broad way, which was basically a series of steps to obtain an outcome. And that would incorporate almost anything. So what that would have set up is a scenario where, let's say some of these states where Nathan and colleagues have passed these amazing laws, I have a right when I go into the repair shop with my car, my car is a Chevy, so it's American made, but let's just say I had a Kia, it was a Korean car. Or we have a trade agreement with Korea, it even has an e-commerce chapter, it doesn't have this lunatic rule in it, this is a new crazy thing industry is demanding. But let's just say some future agreement had that secrecy rule. So then the government of Korea could basically say to the government of the U.S., hey, you can't do this. You have to stop that law because it violates our country's powers and privileges for our car companies and our other companies to have secrecy over this basic information. That's a so-called illegal trade barrier because I have rights under this trade agreement not to have governments saying what kind of information I have to share. And the thing with the trade agreements is they're enforceable. So if you have a tribunal, they're built in tribunals of trade experts say, yep, that right to repair law, mm -mm -mm, that violates that trade, digital trade secrecy rule. Then the U.S. would face trade sanctions until the federal government got rid of the law that theoretically violates these privileges. And so it's like a form of international preemption where you've just basically tied down all kinds of policy space at the state level, at the federal level, to do totally reasonable things because new corporate privileges and rights get embedded in these trade agreements. It's a really sneaky way in which corporations can undermine the power of activists to get the laws they want at the state level, at the federal level. So, Nathan, some of the practical ways that that kind of vague, broad language could implicate what you're doing would be very helpful for our listeners. Yeah, that's a great question. I think at the base level, if an algorithm is a series of steps used to obtain a result, literally, what isn't an algorithm? And how is the steps for physically replacing a battery not a series of st steps? If you hold down the home button and hit the volume key three times and do a hard reset, is that an algorithm? Like what is and what isn't an algorithm? And how easy would it be if you were a manufacturer that was intent on monopolizing repair to come up with a set of processes that you could define in this way and then withhold them from anybody in order to privilege your own repair operations? The second is understanding that because software is running everything, including the headlights in your car, what was the thing that you had to pay $500 for Chevy to program in? That's the firmware. Now, firmware is just a series of programmed instructions. When you get this signal, turn the light on. When you get this signal, turn the light off. 
there is a huge variety of repair restrictions that involve not sharing those programmed instructions, that firmware, and they're all preposterous, right? I mean, I've had farmers tell me a turn signal goes out in their tractor. They replace the turn signal, but because it's a critical safety feature, they've got to pay John Deere dealership employee to drive out to their operation, plug in a laptop and hit a special button to install the firmware. And the firmware in this case is cryptographically keyed to the VIN number of the equipment. It will not operate unless it has a unique identifying number which matches the piece of equipment. So you can't just, you know, one of the things that happened early in right to repair was farmers were kind of just going to like Ukrainian hackers and saying, hey, can you just rip the firmware off this taillight so that I can fix the equipment without having to pay the dealer $850 to come out and hit it? And they stopped doing that because they started what they call VIN burning or putting individual serial numbers in all these things to keep people from doing that. Because it really is a mechanism to control who has access to repair. There's no security reason why you would need a VIN burned signal for your headlight. It's just about that process. So to what extent is that an algorithm? Is that a trade secreted thing? And this is like the instructions telling your headlights how to turn on and off. This is what we're worried about here, that that becomes some kind of protected intellectual secret, um, which is just preposterous and an insult to every single legitimate industry innovation that requires protection. They've just gotten too greedy. Well said. It makes such a clear example of the impact of these kind of sneaky things companies try and slip into trade agreements that have nothing to do with trade. So with enormous gratitude for what you have achieved and congratulations, um, let me ask one final question, which is if folks want to get involved, both to get more informed or to get involved in helping to pass more of these laws, what can people do to engage? We've been having so much progress, and it's all been driven at the state and local level, where, yes, the big tech companies come in and lobby, but it's a little bit more of a fair fight in the state capitol than it is on Capitol Hill. And I think it's because it's a more democratic process and people have more influence over it. And so people can get engaged with their local state perg. If you go to perg.org, it should a little thing will pop up, connect with your state, or you can check out repair.org, which is the coalition. They've got a map uh, of all the states that we're working on. And there's a strong probability that no matter where you're listening in from, we've got something going on because people everywhere just need to fix their stuff. And they're sick and tired of not being able to, from Alabama to Maine and Alaska to Oklahoma to California, people just need to fix stuff. And Nathan Proctor from PERG and his colleagues in the Right to Repair movement are making that more and more possible. So thank you for all of that excellent work on behalf of all of us who have stuff, which is all of us. And thank you, Nathan, for joining us today on Rethinking Trade. This is Lori Wallach. And until next time, check out those websites Nathan mentioned. Bye-bye.